Before we start the video, I want to thank and acknowledge our Harvey Wakuian producer tier channel member who requested this video, Angelus Draven. If you want to request a video like this one or have a discussion topic of your own choosing live on the air for us to cover, become a Harvey Wakuian producer tier member for $4.99 a month today. Now, on with the video. The Lost Boys was directed by Joel Schumacher. Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, 8mm, A Time to Kill, Falling Down, and St. Elmo's Fire. Written by Jan Fisher of the Golden Girls fame. Story by James Jeremias. The Lost Boys, The Tribe. The Lost Boys, The New Breed. Screenplay by Jeffrey Bohm. The Dead Zone, Lethal Weapon 1 through 3. Inner Space, Funny Farm, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and Tales from the Crypt. Produced by Harvey Bernard of Damien the Omen 2, Goonies, and a litany of documentaries, especially of the political and National Geographic style. Also producer on the film was Richard Donner of the Donner Production Company. He was the director of Lethal Weapons 1 through 4, Goonies, Scrooged, The Toy, Superman 1 and 2, and more with a career spanning almost five decades, boasting 85 directorial credits and 37 producer credits. With music by Thomas Newman of Spectre, Skyfall, Wall-E, Six Feet Under, Road to Perdition, Ice Age, Monsters, Inc., Aaron Brockovich, The Green Mile, American Beauty, The Shawshank Redemption, Scent of a Woman, JFK, Star Wars Return of the Jedi, and The Great Outdoors. The Lost Boys was shot on an $8.5 million budget. It brought in $32.2 million at the box office, adjusted for inflation in 2022. That would be $84,130,436.62. It was distributed by Warner Brothers, rated R, and released on July 31st, 1987. The Lost Boys was released against the James Bond flick, The Living Daylight, starring Timothy Dalton, and would finish in second place in its first weekend of widespread release. Coming up short to Bond, $11,051,284 to $5,236,318, and barely squeaked by La Bamba, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, that clocked in at $5,187,778, but that was in its second weekend of widespread release. Next up, the cast, which was a great mix of young and old actors who each brought something great to the table. We'll start with Corey Feldman. No need to go through his resume. As we all know, his track record in Hollywood. Diane Wiest of Edward Scissorhands, Parenthood, Cookie, and Footloose. Jameson Newlander, who would play Alan Frog, was in The Blob, Lost Boys the Tribe, Lost Boys the Thirst, and Bone Tomahawk. Jamie Gertz would play Star. She was in 16 Candles, Solar Babies, and Twister. Corey Haim, we know who Corey Haim is. Edward Herman had a 50-year career. He played Max in this movie, has won a Primetime Emmy and a Tony Award. Barnard Hughes, a 45-year acting career under his belt, a role in Doc Hollywood. Jason Patrick. Now, he and co-star Jamie Gertz were reuniting from Solar Babies, which came out the year before, and we'll cover that movie on the channel here in the coming months. He was in Frankenstein Unbound, Speed 2 Cruise Control, Golden Raspberry Award winner, 1998 nominated, Worst Screen Couple with Sandra Bullock in Speed 2 Cruise Control. Also was in one of my favorite network TV uh, kind of sci-fi mystery shows, Wayward Pines. Kiefer Sutherland played David, the young vampire, Young Guns, Stand By Me, Flatliners, A Few Good Men, A Time to Kill, 24. Oh, and I didn't forget the saxophone player on the beach at the concert, the one all the ladies loved, including, to this day, my mother, and his name is Tim Capello. Also, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the track off the soundtrack, the title track to this movie, Cry Little Sister by Gerard McMahon. Cry, little sister. I would seriously play that song on loop throughout the course of this video if I could get away with it without the copyright. Even that clip right there, I'm probably going to get claimed for that and I'll have to go back and edit it out. But hey, worse things have happened to better people. But underneath everything else, there is a movie here. And a quick overview of this movie would read something along these lines. Divorced mom and her two sons moved to fictional beach town, Santa Carla, California, to live with their father, and events beyond explanation begin to unfold. 
This is both a vampire and a coming of age story running concurrently to each other, these two kind of plots, is we have Patrick's character, Michael, smitten with star, Jamie Gertz, who hangs out with Sutherland's character, David, and his gang of teenage vampires. Michael's younger brother, Sam, played by Corey Haim, meets the Frog Brothers, Feldman and Jameson Newlander, who run a comic book shop for their parents and are vampire hunters. Plus, mom, Lucy, played by Diane Wiest, and her burgeoning relationship with her new boss at the video store, Max, played by Edward Herman, isn't quite what it seems. All of these story arcs collide once Michael drinks the blood from David and becomes a vampire. So it's up to Sam and the Frog Brothers to save Michael and stop the vampire gang from taking over Santa Carla and possibly more. I saw this movie for the first time when it hit VHS because my mother and a couple of my older female cousins rented it. So my cousin Steven and I decided after they watched it, we'd give it a chance. We were both into horror, me a little bit more than him, but we both really liked the vampire genre and enjoyed the movie upon first viewing, even jumping at a few spots in the movie that would scare any seven-year-old. The vampire attack scenes were shot incredibly well for the time with the aerial approach from above on the couple in the hatchback, as well as the boardwalk security guard at the very beginning of the movie who had the run-in with David and his gang of teen vamps. The early kills were off-screen, but the most shocking scene in the movie is the punk rockers getting taken out by the fire. David and the gang stalked and devoured them in a brutal and graphic manner. It's probably in my top five list of vampire kill scenes, easily up there with the hotel sequence and John Carpenter's vampires in my book. While Patrick's Michael may be at the center of the movie, Sutherland chews the scenery whenever he's on screen. His over-the-top portrayal still holds up to this day. And who could forget the famous... How are those maggots? Maggots, Michael. You're eating maggots, how do they taste? When Patrick's Chinese food turns from egg noodles to maggots, the Corys also steal the show again with their undeniable on-screen chemistry and blend of comedy and teenage sarcasm that really shined in this movie, as well as the others they were in together like License to Drive, Dream Little Dream, etc. The supporting cast was on point in this one too, with Herman and Weiss plus Bernard Hughes elevating the B and C plots, making the most of their screen time and not seeming like they detracted from the main story. Hughes brought his signature hilarity even in the bleakest and unreal circumstances, from the iconic opening sequence of the film with the visuals of flying over the ocean to the lights of the boardwalk coming into focus. Mixed with the soundtrack's highlight, Cry Little Sister by Gerard McMahon, which I mentioned earlier, it was a perfect introduction to the future cult classic that I loved. From there, we go right to the officer who forced David and his group, along with the woman and her boyfriend, whom he accosted to leave the boardwalk area, establishing a pre-existing conflict between these characters, and thusly resulting in the security officer's death in a cool sequence when he's pulled up in the air off screen, and as well as the car couple. The sequence was integral in establishing the tone of the movie right from the very beginning. Whilst Haim, Feldman, and Jameson Newlander provided the majority of the levity throughout the film, Jason Patrick provided the darker, brooding atmosphere on the protagonist side, even prior to his transformation into one of the undead. If I'm being perfectly honest, the scene we were introduced to the Frog Brothers at the comic shop is one of my favorite scenes in the movie that doesn't involve a vampire kill. Just because for a short period of time, we get some glimpses of 80s treasures in the form of racks of comics. Speaking of comics, the Frog Brothers reference to the pages of comic books as they explain the vampirology to Haim's character early on, something which I did and continue to enjoy about this movie. My favorite vampire sequence, showing them at what is, in my opinion, their apex in the film, would be the bonfire slaughter in the woods, where David and his group take Michael to show exactly who and what they are. Michael witnesses David and his gang slaughter the group of partiers with whom they had an earlier run-in on the boardwalk, and it's magnificently set to the song Walk This Way by Aerosmith featuring Run DMC, and I cannot get enough of this sequence. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Alex Winter, who plays Marco, one of David's crew, who would go on to star in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure in 1989, 
Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey in 1991, and Bill and Ted Face the Music in 2020. The remainder of the cast was adequate in their roles, especially Sutherland's character and David's group of teenage bloodsuckers. Their presence and look really encapsulate the time in which this movie lives. That big hair, the leather, the metalhead facade. Michael's pursuit of star, Jamie Gertz, puts him in the crosshairs of the vampire gang, which we don't find out until the film's action-packed denouement that Max... Ed Herman is actually the leader of, and his pursuit of Lucy, Diane Weist, was to turn her into a vampire and have her be a, quote, mother figure to his boys, as he called David's gang. This revelation comes on the heels of Michael, Sam, Edgar, Alan, Starr, and Laddie's defeat of all the vampires in David's gang. Yet Michael, Starr, and Laddie remain vampires. Their motivation was per the Frog Brothers' delivery of the exposition that a vampire can only return to human form after the head vampire was vanquished. Upon David's death, after some great wire work in a fight with Michael, they still haven't changed back to humans. But relax, there's a happy ending all around. Not like that. As Grandpa comes to save the day and kills Max by driving his truck through the front of the house and launching a huge wooden stake into Max just as he's ready to bite Lucy and turn her into vampire mommy. This sends Max flying into the fireplace where he immediately bursts into flames and causes an explosion, allowing Hughes to deliver the iconic closing line to put a perfect bookend on the movie. One thing about living in Santa Carla I never could stomach. All the damn vampires. In the hierarchy of vampire films throughout the history of cinema, this one has to rank pretty high on any list in the genre. It's my feeling that it holds up to today in terms of special effects, which are mostly practical, and that makes me enjoy it even more. I feel the widespread and rampant CGI that is so prevalent in movies and television now has done a great disservice to entertainment, and that's because it's lazy and uncreative. That being said, I understand the necessity for the use of green screen and mocap technology because some things simply aren't realistic to, or feasible to do with practical effects. But CGI shouldn't have become the crutch that it has. To bring this back to Lost Boys, if it's the usage of practical effects that makes this movie so good and so much fun to re-watch over and over again, as I have over the years, it may sound cliche at this point, but I really don't care because as the saying goes, they don't make them like this anymore. I hope you enjoyed watching my retrospective of The Lost Boys as much as I did producing it. Speaking of producers, this video was brought to you by a request from Harvey Wakuian producer tier member Angelus Draven. If you join our $4.99 a month tier, you can request a video much like this one. Also submit special discussion topics for our live streams and access a private DM chat with myself and other tier members as well on Twitter. You can also join as a Kazooian for $2.99 a month and I'll send you a Kazoo and Pete Daddy dollar trading card as a way to say thank you for supporting the channel. That's it, gang. Once again, thank you to Angelus Draven for suggesting the review on the Harvey Wakuian producer tier. And now it's time for the usual sign-off. I'm Etep Wakuian of The Place to Be Reviews. I've been here with all of you. If I don't see you, have a great day, a pleasant tomorrow, and I'll catch you on the next one. It's better to burn out than to fade away. I could do